very much, Nike. So um, I'm just going to continue where we left off. So at uh, last lecture, we switched from talking about vector valued uh, uh, functions on the discrete cube to talking about Boolean functions, which is basically the exact opposite. And I just want to remind you what we said last time. Um, so I'm going to call a Boolean function um, for simplicity, a function from the discrete cube to zero, one, rather than minus one, one. Now that makes no difference. Um, and what I tried to argue last time is that there's really only one thing as far as we're concerned that's special about Boolean functions, and which is that if you square them, right, zero, one squared is still only zero, one. So the function remains the same if you square it. And in particular, that means that the variance of the function f up to a factor two, right? So the variance of the expectation of f minus the expectation of f squared is equal to the expectation of the absolute value of f minus the expectation of f without the square, right? So the nice thing about Boolean function is that you can remove or add the square um, and you get the same thing. Um, so um, now, what does the Poincaré inequality say for Boolean function? The Poincaré inequality says that the variance of f is bounded by the expected square gradient of f, right? But for a Boolean function, the variance of f is equal to the absolute mean deviation of f, the expectation of f minus the expectation of f, right? So I just wrote here in the third line, um, I wrote um, over here, um, I wrote just the Poincaré inequality where I replaced the left-hand side instead of writing the variance of f, I wrote the expectation of f minus the expectation of f, right? So um, now we saw last time that this is a very suboptimal inequality for Boolean functions, right? Because um, um, for example, even for a simple function like the majority function, this is very, very far off. And I tried to explain last time that there's a reason for this, which is, you know, on the left-hand side, you don't have a square, but on the right-hand side, you have a square. So really what this is suggesting is that the Poincaré inequality is simply the wrong inequality to look at when you're looking at Boolean functions. We should try to look for an L1 version of the Poincaré inequality, right? Where we also don't have a square over here. And we proved exactly such an inequality, right? So this inequality over here, this L1 version of the Poincaré inequality has nothing to do with Boolean functions, right? This is true for any function of this discrete cube. But for Boolean functions, this inequality is much, much better than the Poincaré inequality because on the left-hand side, you don't lose anything, right? Because for Boolean functions, the left-hand side is the same for the Poincaré inequality in this one. But on the right-hand side, we have gained a square. And that's exactly what, so for example, for, the, for this inequality over here, um, the, 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 for the majority function, you get a sharp result up to universal constant. And I proved this inequality for you last time in two lines because it just followed immediately from the linear to nonlinear principle that we've already developed for vector valued function. Um, now, so uh, that's one reason why for Boolean functions, it's not a good idea to use the Poincaré inequality. Now I want to argue that there's a completely different reason, um, also very well known, that for uh, Boolean functions, uh, the Poincaré inequality gives the wrong answer. And that second reason is that maybe the Poincaré inequality itself uh, is suboptimal. So the reason number one is not stay, saying that the Poincaré inequality is suboptimal. It's just saying that the Poincaré inequality is the wrong inequality, right? You should have used an L1 version of the Poincaré inequality. But the second reason is saying that even if we stuck with the Poincaré inequality, we use the variance, not the, mean, the, the absolute deviation, maybe you can improve on the Poincaré inequality itself, right? Now this might mix together a bit when you think about Boolean functions, because again, for Boolean function, the mean deviation and the, the variance are of the same order. But when I mean the Poincaré inequality is suboptimal, I mean even for functions that are not Boolean, maybe it is true that the Poincaré inequality is suboptimal and that we can do better. And if you can do that for general functions, then maybe that improvement will also help you deal with Boolean functions. Okay. So let me try to explain um, why the Poincaré inequality can be suboptimal. It turns out there's really only one reason why the Poincaré inequality can be suboptimal. And in order to explain this, we should really go back to the proof of the Poincaré inequality. So recall, how did we prove the Poincaré inequality? Um, so I'm now going back to the very first lecture. So what we did is we use this interpolation method. And the interpolation method, there was a key identity which showed up, which was actually an equality for the variance. We had, when we applied the interpolation, we wrote the variance of f as expectation of f squared minus the expectation of f squared. And we interpolated using the heat semigroup. And then we got an identity, which said that this was equal to the integral zero, zero to infinity of the gradient of ptf squared, rather than the gradient of f squared. Right? If we had the gradient of f squared on the left-hand side, we would have um, the Poincaré inequality. But this is not an inequality. This is actually an identity. Right? 
So, so far there was no loss, right? So if the Poincaré inequality is suboptimal, then we have to lose on the next step. And what was, what did we do in the next step? In the next step, we used that the gradient of the semi-group is actually decaying exponentially. Right? We had such an inequality, which we proved using some explicit computations, right? And if you plug this inequality into here, actually I'm missing a factor two. Uh, if you plug this inequality into that identity, then the integral of two e to the minus two t is just equal to one and you get exactly the Poincaré inequality. So because the first guy over here the, 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 is an identity, the only place where you can lose is in the second part where you show that the semi-group is actually forgetting its initial condition at an exponential rate. So how could you hope to gain on the, um, how could you hope to gain um, on the Poincaré inequality, how could we hope to improve, right? Well, look at the second thing. It's saying that the, that, that the behavior of the semigroup as a function of the initial condition is decaying exponentially like this. Right? Well, it could be, so for a general function f, that you can't beat this. For example, for a linear function f, this was actually equality. Remember Poincaré inequality was equality for linear functions, right? So the only hope that you can have is that for certain types of functions, maybe Boolean functions, right? Or maybe under other conditions, Maybe for certain types of functions, the gradient forgets its initial condition at a much faster rate. Okay, so let me draw some sort of hypothetical picture. Suppose that the true behavior for a given function f, the true behavior wasn't this, but you actually became much, much faster. Maybe you reach zero or almost zero at some time t star, right? So you will never actually reach zero at a, at a finite time. But just for sake of argument, think that we almost reach zero at time t star. And t star is very, very short, much shorter than you would expect from e to the minus 2t. Right? Well, if that were to be the case, right? If this were to be the case, if this happens, right? then you see in this integral, I don't have to integral all the way, integrate all the way to infinity. I would just have to integrate up to t star, right? Because after t star, I've already reached equilibrium, right? For the given function f, right? So then, you would actually have that the variance of f is of order not integral from zero to infinity, but it just would be of order integral from zero to t star. And this guy over here is bounded by t star, right, times the expectation of the gradient, sorry, of the gradient of f. So the Poincaré inequality you had here are number one, right? But if for some given function f, um, it so happens that the semigroup decays much, much more quickly that it already reaches equilibrium at time t star, then you can replace that constant one by a constant of order t star. And so if you imagine that you have a function f that, that, that reaches equilibrium at a very, very short time, let's say t star is of order little o one, then you have here significantly beat the Poincaré inequality. And in a sense, this is not only one way to beat the Poincaré inequality. This turns out to be basically the only way to beat the Poincaré inequality because we have an identity in this first identity, right? So you can reverse this argument as well. Right? So um, this is really the only way that we can hope to beat the Poincaré inequality if for the given function that we're interested in, um, we reach equilibrium much faster than this rate e to the minus two t. And this mechanism that I've just shown you here, um, whether implicitly or explicitly, is behind all of the beautiful results in the literature uh, um, improving the Poincaré inequality, right? So there's a long history of this. So the, there's the famous Kahn Kadlai Dinial. Uh, there's a famous theorem of Talagrand, different one about the L1, L2 inequality. Then um, there is, I should single out a, a beautiful paper by Benjamini Kalai. Schramm on percolation. This I'm putting a box around it because to my knowledge, this is really the place where this picture that I've drawn here was made very, very explicit, right? So in these earlier results, they were using Fourier analysis. It wasn't so clear that this was going on, but in this paper, Benjamin Nikolai Schramm, it's really, bam, this is what's going on. And it really clarified the situation. And then there's a, a, a variant of these results due to uh, two, um, in two papers, Falik, uh, Samorodnitsky, Samorodnitsky, and Rossignol, um, 
These are two different separate papers by two separate groups that happen to have discovered exactly the same proof. So this is another variance of uh, the same ideas, etc. Okay, so there is a whole list of ideas over here. Um, so um, this is basically the way that you can be the poker brain equality. So let me write down a theorem of this kind. Okay. Um, and I'm going to write down the theorem in the form that it was derived by, um, by these last uh, two groups, um, because this is going to be the most convenient for us uh, going forward. But it's, uh, you, know, very, you know, the other results over here are just variants of the same theorem. Okay, so um, it just depends on exactly how you arrange the inequality. Okay, so let me write down this theorem. So um, here is a theorem of Falik, Samorotnitsky, and Rossignol. So again, this is not a theorem that's specific to Boolean functions, right? This is a theorem that holds for any um, real valued function on discrete cube, right? So um, what does the Poincaré inequality? Remember the Poincaré inequality says that the variance of if is bounded, let me leave some space, by the expectation of the gradient of f squared, right? That's the Poincaré inequality. And what I said is that if you have this decay that happens very quickly, then you win in the constant. So let me write in the constant here. So the constant is log. So there is here some constant. Let me write the variance of if divided by the sum i is 1 to n of the expectation of the absolute value of tif squared. Maybe let me put a constant here. And let me put a constant here, okay, just for the constant here on the right hand side, I think is two and on the left hand side, I can't remember exactly what it is, okay, but um, let me write such an inequality. Um, and the point of this theorem is that this quantity over here is just the T star that I wrote on the previous slide. Sorry, it's the one over T star because I had the T star on the right hand side of this inequality. Right? So this quantity over here is of order one over T star. Right, will be of order this. And what is the point that you see over here? In the denominator, you don't have the expectation of DIF squared. You have the expectation of DIF with the square outside. And remember that for the for, for Boolean function, so this is an inequality that holds for any function, right? But for Boolean function, right, the expectation of the absolute value of DIF with the square outside is typically much, much smaller than the expectation of the uh, absolute value of the if of the square inside. This is just because, again, the property that 0 or 1 squared equals 0 or 1. And so what this is showing, it's showing you a general mechanism. But in particular, in the case of Boolean functions, it will cause a big improvement on the Poincaré inequality. Right? Whereas, for example, for linear functions, this 1 over t star will be of order 1, and you haven't gained anything. So, um, so that's the idea. So this is just a theorem, okay? Let me, um, so those of you who have done some uh, analysis of Boolean functions will recognize what these theorems um, uh, help you in the Boolean case. But let me just, this is a, this is a boot, boot camp lecture, you know, let me just um, give you a very quick primer on um, the classical story of Kankalai Vinya. Okay, so um, this is just an example. Um, so let's take a Boolean function. Uh, let's take a function f from the discrete cube to zero one. So it's a Boolean function. And think of this as a voting scheme, right? So every voter, there are n voters, and every one of them votes for either Democrat or Republican. And then the outcome of the election is either Democrat or Republican. And this function f describes the rules of the vote, right? Um, now, um, let's make it fair. So let this be fair. What I mean is that the, it's equally likely that the outcome will be Democrat or Republican, just for simplicity. This is just to, 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 to get some idea. Okay. Um, now, what is this expectation of absolute value of DIF? Now, first of all, because this, this function takes only the value of 0 or 1, this is the same as the expectation of the absolute value of DIF squared, right, with the square inside the expectation, right? because 0 squared is 0 and 1 squared is 1. And what is this? We have already encountered this quantity. This is called the influence of voter i, right? So this is just the probability that the outcome will change uh, 
if i flips their the I, if you flip the i fit right so this says that you know this is the probability that if i switch my votes then the outcome of the election will change right that's the influence of me right and every voter has their own influence so um, now you might wonder, you know, there are many different voting schemes. So what can we say about the influences of different voters in a generic voting scheme, right? So what would the Poincaré inequality say? So the Poincaré inequality would say that the variance of if, well, that's one quarter in this case, because we have a fair voting scheme, right? Is bounded by the sum i is one to n of the influence. Let's call it the influence of voter i. Let's call this the influence of voter i. Right? And this is, of course, bounded by n times the maximum influence over all the voters. So what this says is that no matter, no matter what voting scheme you have, um, if you have n voters, no matter what voting scheme you have, there will always be at least one voter who has influenced more than 1 over n, right? That has more than 1 over n probability that if that voter flips their vote, then the outcome of the election will change. And what Kankalai and Nial um, realized is in fact, without any additional assumption, this statement can be improved. In fact, the maximal influence is always greater than some constant times log n over n. And basically, I don't wanna work out all the little details because an exercise, but if you repeat this computation I just did with this improvement of the Poincaré inequality, then you will get exactly this extra term log n that I wrote over there. So um, that's the point of this, uh, uh, of this theorem, if you want, or a point of this theorem, that um, you actually, you see, do significantly better. We made no additional assumptions except that you have a Boolean function, but we see that actually there must have exist a voter who has significantly more influence than you would guess by the Poincaré. And this is a famous paper of Kankala and Dinial where they prove this theorem. Um, so this is a very, very different improvement than you would get from the previous slide, right? From the L1 Poincaré inequality. L1 Poincaré inequality wouldn't give you this improvement, right? You need a, there's a very different reason why this theorem is true, and that's because the Poincaré inequality itself is not um, is not optimal. Um, and correspondingly, in this theorem, it's not the majority function that will get you this log n over n. The majority function has one over n as its influence, as all the influence of all the voters. So in fact, there the equality case or the, the near equality case uh, of this theorem is actually a very different type of voting scheme. It's not the majority function. It's a so-called voting scheme called the tribes function. It works like this. You know, in the United States, we have 50 states, right? So, and every state has a certain number of voters. Right? So suppose you had the following voting scheme the Democrats win the election if and only if there is at least one state in which all the voters vote unanimously for Democrats. This is a very different voting scheme than the majority. Um, you know, the true voting scheme in the US is something in between, you know, it's this electoral college scheme. You know, and you could also write that as a function if. Um, but th this is a different voting scheme. And it turns out that in this voting scheme, there is always a voter with uh, influence uh, at least login. So, um, we have here two very different reasons to go back to the previous slide. Um, I told you there is reason one and reason two, right? There is reason one and reason two why the Poincaré inequality is not uh, not a good inequality for Boolean functions. One of them is that it's the wrong inequality. You should go to this L1 inequality. And the other one is that the Poincaré inequality itself might be suboptimal. And that's a very different reason. They're capturing two different probabilistic phenomena. Now, we have these two different improvements that for Boole for different Boolean function give you improvement. And then you might wonder whether one can combine these two things and get one theorem that explains all of them simultaneously. Right? That's a natural question. And, um, uh, and, and uh, a very specific uh, conjecture was made by Talagrand and it was recently solved by, uh, by Ronel Eldan and Renan Gross. So let me write down what this theorem is. Um, so, this is a conjecture due to uh, Talagant, uh, 97. And it was proved by Eldan and Gross. And let me write it suggestively. So the theorem says the following, for the function f, 
from minus one, one to the n to zero, one. So for any Boolean function, okay. what do we have? Let me write it suggestively in terms of the absolute deviation. But remember that for Boolean function, this, me this mean absolute deviation is just twice the variance. So I could have just written here the variance. And now I can write here the log of this constant, let me write here a constant, over the sum of the influences squared. So this is what you have inside this Falik, Samarudnitsky, et cetera, inequality, but with a square root, is bounded by some constant times the expectation of the, uh, the norm of the gradient of the function. Okay. So this is it. And you see formally, if I go back to the previous slide, if you look at this result of Felix Mornitsky and Rossignol over here, if I take a square root at both sides, I have almost that result on the next slide, but then I have the square root outside the expectation. I have the square root of the variance and the square root of the expectation of the gradient squared, right? And the key point in this inequality is that the square root goes inside the expectation. So I have the expectation of the norm of the gradient, not the expectation of the norm of the gradient squared. See, so if this square root term on the left hand side weren't there, you would have the L1 Poincare inequality, right? On the other hand, if you were to square this inequality, roughly speaking, you would get something like the Kanka Light Lineal or Felix Mondisky Rossignol or whatever you want to call it, right? And here we've just taken those two ingredients and stuffed them in one inequality and, you know, uh, said a few prayers and hoped that it's true, right? And it turns out to be true. Right? So this is exactly a combination of these two other inequalities. Okay. And I want to try to explain to you why this inequality is true. Okay. So that's going to take up the rest of my, um, the rest of my lecture. Um, but in fact, um, there is not much to say uh, conceptually because I've already explained to you why this inequality is true. Right? Why was the, um, why was the, the, why can you improve the Poincaré inequality it's because the variance decays very, very fast. It already decays at order t star, t star being one over log of something, right? The variance is already almost zero. Why do you have the L1 Poincaré inequality? Well, this comes just uh, very easily from our general theory, right? For example, from the, from the linear to nonlinear principle. So if you want to prove this inequality, the natural thing to try to do is just to combine these two things, right? And that's exactly what we're going to do, okay? So um, let me just outline for you. So, so I'm not, you know, I, 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 I'm not really adding anything to what's written in this paper by Eldon Gross, except maybe a little bit simplified presentation. In this paper of Eldon Gross, there's really two steps. There is step one is to prove that the variance of PTF is bounded by something like T star times the variance Sorry, let, let's, let me put it this way. The variance of PTF is bounded by one half of the variance of F. So we already basically achieved um, stationarity for T star of order one over log of this constant over sum I of the expectation, the IF squared, the sum of the influences squared, right? So this is showing that for, um, this is showing that for, for um, functions f with small influences, um, the, the, you, you reach stationarity much, much faster than, um, than you would expect from the Poincaré inequality. And they do this by, uh, by modifying, by improving uh, some result of um, Keller and Kindler. It's not the result of Keller and Kindler, it's an improvement of the result of Keller and Kindler, and I will write down later what it is. Um, so this tells you that you reach stationarity much, much faster than you would expect. And then step two is to take this result and combine it with analysis of Boolean function to prove the theorem. All right, so combine this with analysis of Boolean function to get a sort of L1 Poincaré inequality that's improved by this, by this thing. And they do this using methods of stochastic calculus. And mainly what I will try to do is to shortcut this. Okay, so, so, but, but the steps are just, I mean, this is really the heart of the theorem is what's written over here. And it, it, it is something very, uh, very nice and very good. So, um, very good. I don't see any questions, so I'm just going to steamer. So, um, 
what I, what, where I want to start first is I want to start first by proving how, why step one implies step two. Right? So I want to show you that if the variance of PTF decays very quickly, then you already get such an inequality. Okay? So um, let's prove it. So um, So remember, what is the idea? We don't want to go all the way to time infinity, right? If the variance decays very quickly, we would just go, like to go up to some time T star, right? Because at time T star, we've already reached stationarity more or less, right? And there's nothing more to do, right? So if you think back, how did we prove the L1 Poincaré inequality? Well, we did interpolation, right? We said that the F minus the expectation of F equals the integral from zero to infinity of DDT of PTF. And then we used some simple representation for this derivative. Right? So um, if we don't want to go all the way to time infinity, but we just want to go up to some time t star, well, then why don't we just integrate up to t star in the interpolation? Right? That's what we're going to do. And uh, it gives you the following inequality. So this is an inequality. Rather than having f minus the expectation of f, if I integrate only up to time t, then I just get f minus ptf. If I let t go to infinity, then ptf would go to the expectation of f, and I would get the L1 Poincaré inequality. Right? But let's um, let's just go up to time t, then I get the expectation of f minus ptf, and I claim this is bounded by some constant. You can get much more precise formulas here, but I'm just writing what we need: a constant times square root t times the expectation of the gradient of f. Okay. So this is really the same thing as um, um, this is really the same thing as the uh, L1 Poincaré inequality, except we didn't integrate all the way up to time infinity, we just integrated up to time t. Right? And then you see if the time t is very short, then you do much, much better than the L1 Poincaré inequality. Um, and the proof of this lemma is also the same. Okay, so let's write f minus ptf. This is minus the integral from zero to t of dds PSF, right? So when we prove the L1 Poincaré inequality, we just took this integral to time infinity, you now just taking it up to time t. And then you plug in the same probabilistic representation that we had before, okay? So this is equal to the integral from zero to t of e to the minus s divided by square root one minus e to the minus two s expectation c. And then we had this uh, sum i delta i s times d i f epsilon ds, right? So this was the same probabilistic representation we had before. And now you do the same thing as before, is you just take the absolute value and you take the expectation. Right? So um, this term over here will give you the expected gradient of f exactly like before. Um, and the only thing that changes is that now we have the integral from zero to t of this guy over here but you see for small s, this guy is of order one over square root s for small s, right? Because for small s, e to the minus s is of order one and one minus e to the minus two s is of order s, right? So for small s is of order one over square root s. So if I integrate one over square root s from zero to t, I get square root t, right? And that's where this square root t over here came from, right? So the proof of this lemma is identical to the proof of the L1 Poincaré inequality all we do is we resist the temptation to um, we resist the temptation to integrate all the way up to infinity, and we get a slightly better result. Now the problem is that we don't care about the expectation of f minus ptf, right? We still want on the left hand side to have the variance of f, right? So um, I claim this is automatic. So let me write here corollary. And let me make the distinction, this lemma is true, not just for Boolean functions, but for any real valued function, you have this proof. But now I claim that for Boolean functions, to zero one, this lemma implies what? It implies that the, um, which way do I want to write it? Let me write in terms of variance. The variance of f is bounded by a constant times square root t times the expected gradient of f plus the variance of ptf. 
And, and I want to emphasize that once we have this corollary, then we're done, right? With this part of the proof, because how did the proof go, right? The proof had two steps, right? Step one was to show that the variance of PTF is bounded by one half the variance of F for this time one over log of the one over the sum of the influences squared. Right? So let's suppose this is true, right? So suppose that time one over log of this quantity, the variance of PTF is bounded by one half the variance of F, right? Then over here on the right hand side, the variance of PTF will be bounded by one half of the variance of F if I plug in that time T star. So I can move it to the right hand side, right? Because the variance of F minus one half the variance of F is just a constant times the variance of F, right? So then this term over here disappears. And then over here, I get this square root of T star. T star was one over log of one over the sum of the squares of the influences, right? And then I get exactly that guy over there from this square root T, right? If I divide the square root T on the right hand side. Is this clear? So, so, so this lemma, this corollary takes care of that arrow over there, right? It just reduces the problem to understanding that at very short time, the variance has decreased uh, sufficiently so that you can ignore the rest of the time. Of it, right? So um, it takes care of half the problem. Um, I'm assuming if there are questions about this, that somebody will interrupt me. This is really where we um, have the, the disadvantage of, uh, of giving online talks, beside the fact that I'm talking into a black hole and I can't see anybody, um, is that, you know, if I'm standing in front of a blackboard, I would have all of these slides up next to each other on different blackboards and you could see the formulas and you would see immediately what I'm saying. But now I have to flip back and forth and it's a little bit confusing, okay? But I hope it was, it was, uh, it was enough. Um, let me prove this corollary. Actually, I claim the corollary is already proved in the previous lemma. We just have to realize for Boolean functions. So let's take a Boolean, a Boolean function can always write as an indicator function of a set, right? It's one if, 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 if the epsilon is an A and zero otherwise. And let's compute what is the expected deviation of F minus PTF. Right? So this is, so F is the indicator of A. So let me just replace that here. So just me, let me just write this as the expectation of indicator A, of indicator A minus PT indicator A, plus the expectation of indicator of A complement, which is one minus indicator A times indicator A minus PT indicator A. Right? I've just written one equals one minus A plus one, in the, sorry, one minus indicator A plus indicator A. Well, on the, the set where a equals one, indicator a equals one. So the first term over here is uh, nothing else than the expectation of one minus, sorry, indicator a, right? So what am I saying? On the set a, the absolute value of indicator a minus pt indicator a is just one minus pt indicator a. So we have this. And in the second term, on the event where A is not true, one minus indicator A is one exactly when A is not true, indicator A is zero. So then this absolute value is just PT indicator A. And now what we just have to do is we just have to expand the, 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 the cross terms, right? So we get here, um, what do we get? We get the expectation of F, right? It's the probability of A minus the expectation of F PTF. Right? And in the second term, we get the expectation of PTF. But remember the expectation of PTF is just the expectation of F by stationarity. Was this, this, was, this was property zero of the semigroup. So we get another term like this. And the second term is again the expectation of indicator of F PTF. So we get the two here too. Right. Um, now it's just a matter of rewriting. So expectation of F is not the variance of F. The variance of F is the expectation of F minus the expectation of F squared, right? So this is two times the variance of F minus 
the expectation of um, uh, f minus the expectation of f, pt f minus the expectation of f. So I've just added and subtracted inside the expectation of f squared. Um, and now you have to remember that pt is e to the t times the Laplacian. So the expectation of f times ptg, this is the inner product of f e to the t times the Laplacian g, which is the inner product of f e to the t over 2 Laplacian e to the t over 2 Laplacian g. And because this Laplacian is symmetric, you can write this as the expectation of pt over 2 f times pt over 2 g. Okay. So all I've written here is 2 times the variance of f minus the variance of pt over 2 f. And that's it, because you see, if I plug this, uh, if I plug this over here, here I have two times the variance of f, sorry, this is expectation of f minus ptf, right? That's this guy over here, right? Is equal to two times the variance of f minus the variance of pt over two f, right? So I can get here two times the variance of f, less or equal constant square root t expectation of the gradient, plus two times the variance of pt over two f, and that's exactly what I wrote over here, except I worked at time 2t instead of at time t. So I didn't really do anything over here. I just wrote down the variant. Remember, we had this identity, the expectation of f minus the expectation of f is twice the variance of f. I just wrote down the equivalent of that identity for the expectation of the absolute value of f minus ptf. And we got exactly this, this inequality. So uh, I'm sorry, my slide is a little bit messy, but I hope it's clear that uh, this is a um, this was a very basic computation. Um, very good. Um, is there a question so far? So let me again emphasize that if we know, let me write it in this slide, even though it's going to be a mess, um, just because. Uh, uh, it's easier to see when I, I have a request form. to uh, scroll down a bit of your, your screen. Slow down or move down? Scroll down. You're, we cannot scroll see the bottom. Down. Yeah. Very good. So, good. So let me, um, let me just write in here. Remember that the proof has two steps, step one and step two. Step one was to show that, I haven't done step one yet. Step one is to show that the variance of PTF is less or equal one half times the variance of f. So we've already basically reached stationarity for t of order one over the log of one over sum of the expectation of dif squared, right? That was step one. So let's pick this t, right? And let's plug it into this equation, right? Then the, the, on the right-hand side, the variance of ptf will be bounded by one half of the variance of f. So I can move that term to the left-hand side, variance of f minus one half of the variance of f is just one half of the variance of f, right? So then I get that the variance of f is two times constant square root t of the expectation of the gradient of f for this t, right? So what inequality have we proved? We've proved that the variance of f is bounded by the expected gradient of f times one over the square root of the log of one over the sum of the influences squared. And if I move that square root from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, that is the conjecture of Talagrand that was proved by Eldan and Gross. So this argument over here hasn't yet shown us why it's true that Boolean functions do better than the usual, right? It has just shown us that if we can show that, um, that for functions with small influences, the decay to equilibrium goes faster than usual, then not just will you get an improvement on the Poincaré inequality, which was this result of Felix, Mordnitsky, et cetera, but in fact, you will also get an analogous improvement of the L1 Poincaré inequality. Why? Because you can just do the same hack that we did to the Poincaré inequality to improve it. You can apply the same hack to the proof of the L1 Poincaré. Okay, so um, that's all we have done. Good. Are there uh, any more questions about this? 
All right, let me move on. So what, what remains is to prove for you the step one. And um, now this step one, um, it has nothing to do with the rest of what I've, uh, I've, I've told you. Um, this really uses just classical methods of, Boolean, uh, of analysis of Boolean functions, okay? And um, um, so, um, you know, we had a theme about using these simple probabilistic representations to prove things. And here it allowed us to simplify this step two um, of this proof. But in order to, to, to wrap up the story, we have to do this step one. I have to explain to you why these type of Boolean functions behave better, right? Why they decay faster to equilibrium than, than a typical function. Um, and I really just have to go back to classical techniques of Boolean, of analysis of Boolean functions. But um, so some of you may know these techniques. And if you, uh, if you don't, then I hope that uh, I will teach you something classical in the next remaining, uh, in, in my remaining time. And I have prepared several different proofs of this theorem. So we'll see, it depends on how far I am by the time I've actually stated it, uh, which one I will, uh, you know, which one I will use. Um, so let's write down the theorem. Um, so uh, I remind you that for uh, this step, uh, Eldan and Gross use an improvement of a result of keller kindler So let me formulate it. So remind, let me remind you that what we need to show. I already wrote it on the previous slide, but let me remind you what we need to show. Um, we need to show that the variance of PTF is bounded by one half of the variance F, right? So we've already basically reached stationarity, but when T is very, very small, the order one over log of one over some I is one to N of the expectation of the absolute value of DIF, squared and there will be a constant somewhere and probably there's a constant here too. Let me put constants here. This is what we have to show. And I can write, um, I could write in front of this theorem and then you would have a theorem, right? Um, but let me write it a little bit more suggestively. So uh, or lemma, whatever proposition, what do you want to call it? Let's call it proposition. Um, here it is. So for, so what is this proposition? This is in a simpler form, Keller, Kindler, and in this improved form, Eldan, Gross. Okay. So what it says is that for Boolean functions, oops, for Boolean functions, And any t, let's say between, uh, let's say any t between zero and one, we're interested of course in very small t. So um, the variance of PTF is bounded by the variance of f times um, some i is one to n the expectation of the absolute value of the IF squared. So whatever we have over there in the denominator. To the power of some constant times T. So um, you see the if, if the variance of PTF we're bounded by e to the minus a constant times t times the variance of f, right? Then you wouldn't get anything. You just get a constant one. But here we get something larger than one inside the brackets, which is the improvement. And why does that imply this inequality over here? Um, why does that imply this inequality over here? Well, some, you know, sum of influences squared to the power ct is just e to the power of ct times log of the sum of influences squared. So if I take t to be one over that log, then this second term over here will just become a constant, right? And I can make it as small as I want by picking the constant as small as I want. Right? So for t sufficiently small, right? So maybe I should be pedantic, right? This term over here is just equal to e to the ct log of c sum i is one to n. Maybe I have need a one over somewhere. I probably need a one over somewhere. 
Let me check. Or a minus CT in the exponent. Ah, that would help a lot. No, uh, it should be C times T. That shouldn't be minus CT or a minus CT in the exponent. Um, now I'm confusing myself greatly. I have one over the, the variance one. should definitely be going down as T increases. The variance should be going down as T increases. So maybe I need it with a minus T. No, no, but this, this, this quantity over here, of course, this is good when it's small, so it's less than one. Right. Um, right, so we should think of this quantity over here as being less than one. Right, so let's write it like, good. So thank you for the help. I should write this as e to the minus ct times the log of one over some i is one to n of the expectation, the if squared. There we go, right? I have minus log of one over something. Mm -hmm. And now if I pick T to be one divided by this thing times a constant, a sufficiently large constant, right? Then I get E to the minus a sufficiently large constant. And I just have to choose the constant sufficiently large that this E to the minus that thing is, is less or equal one. Right? And then I get this statement over here at the top. Right? So if I choose T to be, if I choose T to be this thing, I have too many constants. But if I choose T to be something like this, then this log over here cancels, right? I will get a constant in here. So there's a constant there. So I should have a constant there, right? So these constants, whenever I write C, it's a different constant, okay? So because I keep forgetting which one I'm choosing, right? But if I do T to be one divided by this times a constant, I just get E to the minus a constant, right? And I'm allowed to pick that constant as large as I want because I can pick this constant over here as large as I want. And so I can make this less than one. Right? And that's why we get um, this statement over here. So, um, so what I really need to prove is I need to prove this proposition over here, um, which, uh, um, which is more, yeah, which, 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 which is the right thing. To prove. So, um, Let's see now, I have about 10 minutes. So, um, very good. We will go to the short proof. Um, let me, I wanna do two things. So, so um, the proof of this theorem um, um, or proposition, if you will, um, it just depends, how you do it depends on where you start. So, um, I've prepared a proof completely from scratch without assuming any background whatsoever. Um, but I don't have time to do it all in 10 minutes. Um, and that was what I feared, which is why I prepared several proofs. So what I would like to do, I think the most efficient usage of our time, is that I first give you some general intuition for those of you who have never thought about such questions before. I give you some general intuition why theorems like this are true. And this intuition is, is, is a very useful intuition to have in your head. Um, it is usually derived from a property called hypercontractivity, um, but you don't need to. And I'm, I want to explain to you this intuition uh, about why you get such, why do you get such quick convergence? Just convergence at time little o one. I want to give you a little bit of general intuition why you should expect that for Boolean functions. Then I will probably only have five minutes left so then rather than showing you how to de develop this intuition from scratch, I fear that um, I promised you I'm going to prove everything I do from scratch, but I can't do it in five minutes. So what I will do is the very last five minutes of my lectures, I will just give a proof for the experts. Okay. Roman, the you, can, you can run over time a little bit. I can run over time. The problem is that, you know, I will run over time by about 15 to 20 minutes probably. And that's, uh, I, I, you know, I don't want people to tire out for Jelani's talk. So maybe what, what it would be better, okay, here's my proposal. I'm going to give you some general intuition that everybody should understand. Then I'm going to give you a five minute proof of this for the experts. Basically this follows in three lines from hypercontractivity plus the theorem of Felix Monitsky Rosignol. Okay, so I'll show that, that's easy, right? Um, then you see that this theorem follows sort of from well-known well results. Um, 
And then if people want in the question answer session, I can do a short version of the complete of the from scratch proof, where maybe I skip some steps which are very standard, but I will at least give you some intuition about um, how you can think of this without just hitting it with standard tools. Okay, so is that does that seem reasonable? Then hopefully there will uh, be enough time to decompress before Giovanni stop. Okay, let's do it. Uh, let me give you some intuition. Uh, let me um, let me again make up a name for it. It's the arithmetic mean geometric mean principle. Um, so I want to try to explain to you why you can expect that Boolean functions um, will uh, uh, will reach where, well, why the semigroup will reach, reach equilibrium for Boolean functions much much quicker than you would than you would have it in general for for, for example a linear function. Okay? And I want to explain some sort of general intuition for why it's true. From this intuition, it's not 100% obvious how to go to the proposition. It requires a few more steps. Okay, but let's let's let me discuss this AMG analysis. So. Um, Remember that um, in the, uh, uh, let's not think about Boolean functions, but let's think for a moment about functions from the discrete cube that are non-negative. Boolean functions, when they take the value zero and one are non-negative. So this is a useful picture to have in your mind. And remember that the Poincaré inequality says something about exponential decay. So let me use for a moment this corner here at scratch paper, the, the um, the Poincaré inequality says something about exponential decay of the semi-group to equilibrium. It says something like variance of PTF is bounded by e to the minus 2t times the variance of e. Okay. Now, if you write out what this is, or you could express this in terms of the expectation of the gradient square, this turns out to be equivalent. Okay. Now, if you rearrange this, if you write the variance of the expectation of the square minus the expectation of the function squared, then um, what you get is something like this. You get that the expectation of PTF squared is bounded by e to the minus 2t times the expectation of f squared plus 1 minus e to the minus 2t times the expectation of f squared. Okay, this is just rewriting this inequality over here, right? I've just expanded the definition of the variance on both sides and I've used that the expectation of PTF is equal to the expectation of f. So, what you see from this formula is that the Poincaré inequality implies that at any time t, the vary or the, the size of PTF of the semigroup, it interpolates, which we already knew. This is how we derived the Poincaré inequality. The semigroup interpolates between the expectation of f squared and the expectation of f squared, right? That's exactly what the semigroup does. And it does so in an arithmetic mean like this. Right? So for example, for small t, this is something like expectation of f squared plus t times the expectation of f squared. Now, what was special about Boolean functions? For Boolean functions, the expectation of f, uh, the expectation of f squared, this term, tends to be at least that the probability is small. This term will be much, much smaller than that term, right? That tends to be what happens for Boolean functions. But this, this inequality with arithmetic mean doesn't actually uh, help us, right? Because suppose this is very small. Right, suppose this is even zero, just for heck of it. Of course, it can't be if it's non-negative, but suppose this is even zero, just for the heck of it. Um, in order to pick a time t, right, this term over here will be of order one minus t or one minus two t. So in order to pick a time t where this is less than one half of that, I would still need to have a time t of order one, right? Because this is an arithmetic mean. Now, on the other hand, we could have the following dream Maybe we could improve this inequality. Maybe instead of having an arithmetic mean, we could have a geometric mean, something like this. Of course, I couldn't have it with the same coefficients because the inequality for arithmetic and geometric means goes the other way. But maybe with some slightly better co or some worse coefficients, we could have um, we can have a geometric mean rather than an arithmetic. Now you see that um, now you see that we do much better because now you see this can be written equivalently, right? As the expectation of f squared times the expectation of f divided by the expectation of f squared, like this, one minus e to the minus t, right? So if for Boolean functions we argue that this is often very very small, so if that is very very small, 
then we could choose t to be very, very, very small in order to still get just a constant in front. And that would exactly help us, right? So the picture that you should have in mind is that if here is expectation of f squared and somewhere very close to zero is the expectation of f squared, right? Then this e to the minus 2t, right? You, you have this, this is the Poincaré inequality. And you would still need to have time t of order one in order to reach one half of the expectation of f squared. But the arithmetic mean, the, sorry, the geometric mean goes to zero much, much quicker, right? It reaches one half over here at time of order log of the expectation of uh, uh, f squared divided by the expectation of f squared or minus one over this, something like that, right? which when this becomes very, very small, it's probably one over this. So when this becomes very, very small, um, this, this will be, uh, you, you, you know, you will have a, a time of little order little low. So these type of phenomena tend to happen because um, you can replace an arithmetic mean by a geometric mean. Now this seems very suspicious, but the beautiful thing is that this dream is a reality. And I just for sake of, 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 of giving it a name, I called it the AMGM principle. It turns out that this convergence to equilibrium for non-negative functions actually happens in a much better way than you expect. It doesn't, doesn't just happen in a sort of geometric, sorry, arithmetic mean way. It happens in a kind of geometric mean way. And this is really the phenomenon. This is an improvement over how we usually think about ergodicity. And it's really this phenomenon over here that, um, that is the, the cause um, of all of these improvements of the Poincaré inequality. And usually this, this reality is proved from an even stronger, uh, usually, uh, this is proved using an even stronger statement, uh, which is called hyperconductivity. Um, but you don't need to prove it using hyperconductivity. You can prove it directly by hand. And in fact, you get something slightly better than you can prove using hyperconductivity, which I never noticed until I was preparing this lecture. Um, but uh, um, you could prove such an inequality directly by hand and it would explain why this, um, um, why this phenomenon happens. But if you take this phenomenon for granted, then you can, then you can, um, then you can expect, uh, um, you can expect the type of uh, things to happen that, that happen. Let me, um, uh, very, very quickly indicate to you, to the experts. So I'm going to take like three minutes for the experts and then, uh, uh, you know, you can ask me questions and if there's time, I can give you some intuition from scratch about why you get this AMG in principle. But let me, um, uh, where was my slide? Let me very quickly argue to you where this proposition comes from um, without going from scratch. So let's copy paste it. Oops. Um, so if we don't go from scratch, but we just try to um, prove it directly, I want to argue that this is in some sense just an integrated form of the proof of the result of Felix Monitsky and Rossignol. Okay, so I, I didn't just give you that form for nothing. Um, Remember that Felix Maudmitsky Rossignol said that the variance of function f times log of variance of f divided by sum of the expectation dif squared is bounded by some constant times the expectation of df squared. Right? This was the, the, the improvement on the Poincaré inequality. So this is a known result. It's a KKL type result. There's another constant somewhere maybe here. Um, so this is a KKL type result. And I claim that this inequality is essentially an integrated form of this inequality. Okay, let's check. What is DDT of variance of PTF? This we already computed because this is exactly how we computed the uh, interpolation formula um, in the proof of the Poincaré inequality, right? This is just minus the expectation of the gradient of PTF squared. And now you can just plug this inequality over here. Here we have the expectation of the gradient square, plug this formula in for PTF, right? So you will get that this is bounded by one over a constant 
times the variance of PTF times log of the variance of PTF divided by the constant times the sum of the expectation di di PTF squared. Okay. Um, there's a minus, I forgot a minus because there's a minus here. Um, now this PT over here, you can just remove it by Jensen inequality. The inequality goes the correct direction. So let's pretend like this guy over here doesn't depend on PT, right? That's the Jensen inequality will go the correct direction to get rid of that guy, okay? So this term is what we want. And now you have here a differential inequality for DDT of the variance of PTF, right? And you just do calculus, right? You, you do the chain rule, apply it to log of the variance of PTF. This variance will cancel. Here you have another log of the variance of PTF, right? So just by, by, uh, by calculus, simple calculus will give you the inequality, the variance of PTF is bounded by the variance of F times E to the minus T, uh, and then times constant, the, sorry, there's should be a constant here probably, times constant sum I of the expectation DIF um, squared times one minus E to the minus T, right? So this is just integrating this differential inequality and now it looks like we're almost done, except there's a little issue. If we write this as the variance of F times something, like in the result, right? It's the variance of F times something. The variance of F times C times some I is one to N of the expectation DIF squared divided by the variance of F. One minus uh, E to the minus T over C. Um, oops. 1 minus e to the minus t over c. And the issue is that in this, uh, I don't know why that doesn't erase. Um, the issue is that in the, um, in the inequality, there is no 1 divided by the variance of f in here. On the other hand, we haven't yet used that f is a Boolean function, right? This inequality I proved here is true for any function. Right? So um, we haven't yet used that f is a Boolean function. So now you just distinguish two cases. One of them is where if the variance of f is greater or equal, let's say the square root of some i is one to n of the expectation dif squared, right? Then you can just remove this variance of f over here. You'll just get a square root, right? And that's fine because one minus e to the minus t over c is just uh, it's still of order t if I put a one half in front of it, right? On the other hand, if the variance of f is, bound, is upper bounded by this thing, right? Then you can just directly apply hypercontractivity because then you can just say that the expectation of PTF, sorry, the variance of PTF, PTF by hypercontractivity is bounded by the variance of F to the, some power. This is like something like one plus OT, right? And then if you apply this inequality, then you're done. So that's the proof very quickly for the experts. Unfortunately, not from scratch, but if people want to hear me give a sort of uh, uh, very quick explanation about how you would prove this from scratch, I'm very happy to do it. So um, let me end there. I would like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me. And uh, in particular, um, I only noticed it at the very end of the third lecture that there is this Q&A and the organizers, rather than uh, you know just sitting back and uh, snoozing during my talk, seem to have been very, very active in answering questions on my behalf. I really, really appreciate it. So thank you very much for both of those things. Um, and uh, let me end here. Thanks. Okay, Roman, thank you so much for these beautiful lectures. Um, so there, we, we do still have some questions. Uh, uh, Clément, is your microphone working? Okay, actually, I think Clément's microphone is, is not working. So he had two questions. Um, uh, first question, uh, he said, this is maybe orthogonal to the focus of this lecture, but can these techniques similarly be used to give alternate proofs of the level one or level K inequalities for, for Boolean functions and for Gaussian? Um, so, Unfortunately, Clément, I, I do not have the exact definitions of level one and level two inequalities in my head, which makes it hard to answer the question. Um, I learned about these two names from a talk by Ronen about this paper, 
and I, I have promptly forgotten what they think, what these things mean. If I recall correctly, they can be proved rather easily using not these techniques, but actually using the same type of techniques that we probabilistic representation um, that we um, uh, that we use to prove the vector valued inequalities. Um, yeah, but, maybe I'll comment on that. If yes, you please, Ronan. Yes, on. yeah. So. Yeah, somehow, the, especially in Gaussian space, the level K inequalities are, are somehow simpler than those inequalities. They basically say <clears throat> that um, the, if, if you want to maximize the Kth moment given a measure, this is done on half spaces. And, and like you, you have a much simpler geometric proof of that. Actually, you Kth can moment of the semigroup. No, 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 just, just the integral of X to the K or over like, or, or the norm of the K tensor over a set. So just, ah. just think of the level one inequality is just the integral of X over a set, mm -hmm. given the, me if you fix the measure of a set, this is maximized for a half space. And I mean, somehow, using these methods to prove these inequalities. I don't know if you can do it, but even if you can, this is a total overkill because these inequalities are usually much simpler. But in fact, the other way around is true. You can use uh, moment inequalities to prove uh, these inequalities in a way that kind of bypasses hypercontractivity, which was used by Ramon in, in a certain sense. At least quoting the you know result of uh... of uh, I, I don't remember the the names but Alex Mondeski Rossignol yeah um, um, yeah yeah ah yeah okay I mean all of this can be proved uh, by hand uh, very quickly but but. Um, but one, you know, the proof I have in mind sort of emulates hyperconductivity, just much simpler, right? You don't need full hyperconductivity for you to, to prove this result. You only need a very special case, which is much easier to prove. But uh, yes, I, I'm yeah. Ronen answered much better than I would have been able to. I, I the problem is I don't know so, exactly so, what the so name is. Instead of this special case of hyperconductivity, you could replace it by the so-called level one inequality. It doesn't matter that much, I guess. At least for this, if this is what you're trying to achieve, it doesn't matter that much. What was the second question, Nike? Uh, the second question is about the proposition here. Uh, is it true only for T at most one? Um, no. OK, let me write down what I could prove. I just wrote t at most one because you see really in the exponent, I don't have t, I have e to the minus t over c and t, uh, e to the t over c. And I just wanted to replace this by a constant times t, which is why I wrote that just for simplest. Probably I don't need it at all, but it was just simpler for me. You know, for small t, one minus e to the minus t is of order t, right? So that's, all, that's the only reason I wrote t less than one. Um, here is what I could prove uh, by hand, the variance of PTF, is bounded by the variance of f times two times the square root. Some i is one to n of the expectation dif squared to the power of some function theta t. Okay, and this is true for all t. And this function theta t that I ended up with, but I have to look it up, is log of two over one plus e to the minus two t divided by log two. Whatever this function is, this function is of order t, small t, right? And that's, so that's that's what this inequality is. And the only funny thing about this statement, which is just, a, you know, I, I'm not claiming this is the optimal statement. That's what naturally came out of the proof that I wrote down from scratch. and. The only funny thing I would like to emphasize about it is that this function theta t is strictly better than what you can get from hyperconductivity. And somehow, if you prove this simpler simpler consequence of hyperconductivity from scratch, you find out that hyperconductivity is suboptimal. 
for this AMGM principle, you can actually do better than hyperconductivity. This was a surprise to me. I didn't know that, but I cannot think of any reason why you would care. But uh, this is a funny consequence. But, but this is what I could prove without any attempt at doing any better. Um, and, uh, and you see this is true for all T. So there's nothing, you know, nothing magical about T between zero and one, except I wanted to say that it's function theta T of his order big O of T. So, you know, for small T. So that's why I said T less or equal to one for small T. But probably this function is just bounded by a constant times T for all T. Um, can that be true? No, because this term is, so I, I don't know for, I, I have to think about it. But certainly for T less than one, you would have such a bound, right? And that's why I forced for, you know, just to be sure I wrote down T less than one. Now we're interested in this for very small t, right? Because if t is of order one, you can't improve on the Poincaré inequality, right? So you don't really care about this thing when t is large. All right, is there another question? There are, but um, if you, maybe now is a good time to give a description of the alternate group. Okay, let me just give you a, a very quick rundown and, and, and uh, I will skip some standard steps. Mostly what I want to, to explain is the intuition. Why is this AMG in principle true? Right? So, um, so can we understand the mechanism that causes it, right? Without for the moment to worrying so much about the, you know, the details. Um, and um, actually it's very easy to understand. Let's think about the case N equals one. Okay, so we have a function from zero, one. So we have a, a discrete cube of dimension one, two R plus. And in this case, remember, we had an explicit formula for PTF. PTF was equal to e to the minus t times f plus one minus e to the minus t times the expectation of f. Okay, this is just the explicit formula for the one dimension. This is the random walk in dimension one, right? It was something very simple. Before the first time that the clock rings, which happens by time t with probability e to the minus t, nothing happens. And after that, we've replaced it by an independent copy. So from this, if you compute the expectation of PTF squared at just a trivial computation, you get that this is equal to e to the minus t of the expectation of f squared plus one minus e to the minus two t times the, exp oh, times the uh, expectation of f. Oops, I don't know what just happened. So we get uh, expectation of PTF squared is equal to e to the minus two t of the expectation of f squared plus one minus e to the minus two t times the expectation of f squared. Now you might worry that we're completely screwed because remember, what was the intuition? This thing that I just wrote down is true in one dimension. That's what we would get from the Poincaré inequality, right? With an inequality. But I just claimed that in dimension one, this is true of equality, right? So in dimension one, you have not an, a, a geometric mean, you have an arithmetic mean with equality, right? Which seems like we're screwed. You can't upper bound an arithmetic, uh, a, a geometric, uh, sorry, an arithmetic mean by a geometric mean, right? The arithmetic mean, geometric mean inequality goes the other way, right? So for example, if I have two numbers, A and B, right? The arithmetic mean, right? It's always lower bounded by the geometric mean, but you can never expect to have such an inequality, right? For example, what happens if B equals zero, right? If B equals zero, the right-hand side is zero, but the left-hand side is not zero, right? So you can never hope to reverse the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality in general. But it turns out you can reverse the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality if you assume that that can't happen, what I just said, right? So here is a simple exercise, okay? About, so let's reverse the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality, okay? So uh, my claim is that if you assume that A and B cannot be too far apart, so for example, B is upper bounded by A, upper bounded by, let's say 2B, okay? So if A and B cannot be too far apart, then for lambda between zero and one, the arithmetic mean one minus lambda A plus lambda B 
is upper bounded by a to the one minus mu b to the mu for mu being a function of lambda is log of one over one minus lambda over two divided by log two. And of course, this function should look familiar to you from what I just wrote. That's exactly the function. If you choose lambda to be something like one minus e to the minus two t, that's exactly the function I wrote out for the AMG. So, and this is a simple exercise. You just notice that, first of all, divide both sides by, uh, by b. Okay, so divide both sides by b. Then you just have something as a function of a ratio of a and b, right, which is between uh, uh, one and two, right? And then if you subtract the left-hand side from the right-hand side, this is a concave function. So it's minimized at one of the, it's a concave function of a over b. It's minimized at one of the endpoints. And you can just check that this mu is the best you can do, right? So this is very simple. So in order to apply this in dimension one, what would you need? You would need to show that the expectation of f squared, well, obviously this is always bounded by the expectation of f squared, this is Jensen. But in order to apply this reverse AMG inequality, you'd have to show that this is bounded by two times the expectation of f squared. Right. Well, in general, this is not true, of course, but it is true on the one dimensional discrete cube. Right? Because in the one dimensional discrete cube, this is f of one plus squared plus f of minus one squared over two. Well, that's certainly bounded by f of one plus f of minus one squared over two. And that's exactly this, right? So this, where, where does the discrete cube help us? The discrete cube is very discrete. It only has two points. And in a two dimensional, in R2, the L1 norm and the L2 norm are comparable with a constant factor here in this square root two. This is not true in a general, um, in, in, in R3, for example, the constant would have to depend on three. And in Rn, it would have to depend on n. But in R2, it's very simple because you have a direct comparison between the L1 and L2 norm in R2. And that means you can reverse the AMG inequality, right? Which shows that this geometric mean can be upper, sorry, this arithmetic mean can be upper bounded by a geometric mean, some function one minus theta of t times expectation of f squared times theta of t and this function theta of t just comes directly from this uh, from this thing so this is in dimension one but once you have it in dimension one then you can use a standard idea on the discrete cube you can just tensorize this inequality to get it in dimension n so what you do is if i have an n dimensional if they have the n dimensional problem right remember these semigroup acts as just the expectation over independent coordinates of the function so I can just take the expectation one, one entry at a time, apply the one dimensional inequality, do Holder's inequality, and then do it over and over again, and I will get the same inequality in dimension n. So I'm skipping this part, but this is a standard trick on the discrete cube that once you have a one dimensional inequality that's like this, you can tensorize it and you get it in any dimension with all of the same constants and everything. And that gives you this AMGM principle on dimension n. Now, then to go from there to, so this gives you, um, this gives you this, for example, this second step over here in the proof, you can get directly from this AMG inequality. But to get this first step in the proof, you have to prove something else, right? So what I've just shown you is that the variance of PTF is bounded by the variance of F to something like one minus constant times T times the expectation of F minus the expectation of F to the power constant times t, something like this, right? But I still need to replace this by the sum of the expectation of um, uh, dif squared, right? And here, what you do in order to do that is you combine this inequality with the proof of the F. Stein inequality. And this is exactly the trick that is used in the paper of Alex Mornitsky and Rossignol. It's exactly that trick. What you do is you write, so for those of you who know, you can always write f minus the expectation of f as, as a martingale, as a sum i is one to n of the expect, when I take the expectation over ei plus one to epsilon n of f, minus when I take the expectation over epsilon i to epsilon n of f. So I've written f minus the expectation of f as a martingale. And the variance of f is exactly the sum i is one to n of the expectation of the square of these guys because it's a martingale. And what you can do is you can um, plug these terms over here into this inequality. 
And then you get exact immediately from that simple trick, you get this first inequality over here. That's it. That's the whole proof. So it's really two types of tensorization. Once you have a reverse AMG inequality in one dimension, you can tensorize that in the usual way, the same way that you would tensorize hyperconductivity, for example. And at the same time, from that AMGM principle, you can tensorize in a second way. You can apply the Martingale trick in the proof of Efron Stein, and that will immediately get you this uh, the sum of the influences squared. And so this was very quick. I realized that to actually write down all the details would take me more time, but it wouldn't introduce any new ideas, right? It's just, it gives you an idea about how you can prove this thing completely from scratch. And every step is a very natural, very simple principle that we know how to do on good. So that's the proof I had in mind, but but you know to dot all the i's and cross the t's will take me some time. But it's not really any harder than what I did over here. That's it. Uh, that's that was my spiel. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to take a very short break, and then we'll come back in about uh, eight minutes for Jelani's talk. Thanks again. Thank you.